Captain uh, Thad Garger attended the United States Air Force Academy prior to his active duty service with the United States Air Force over 11 years. He accumulated over 3,000 flight hours flying the T-38, the B-1, and as I mentioned, the F-117. He'll tell you more about that. But he flew multiple combat missions over Yugoslavia in the stealth fighter in 1999 in Operation Allied Force. Um, Thad's various Air Force decorations include the Distinguished Flying Cross, Aerial Achievement Medal, and the Air Force Commendation Medal. Thank you so much for coming out, sharing this information with us. Like I say, this is why the museum is here. Thank you for your service, but thank you for continuing on with the stories. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Question. It's always nice when Greg starts off the day with all the thanks, so thank you. And by the way, it's humbling, the people that stood up that were in the military, thank you all for your service. It's great uh, to have you here today. So as Greg said, I'm very fortunate. It's the third time I've been invited out here. And again, we do like to come out from Boston, Massachusetts. The weather's a little bit different this time of the year. So thank you for having us. It's great to be here. And this afternoon, we're going to do something a little bit different than what I've done the last couple of times. because. The last couple of times I've had that stealth fighter that's in the hangar next to us behind me, right? And I'm pointing at it. As Greg said, it would be very difficult to get a B-1 in this hangar, or for that matter, any other hangar that's at this air museum because it is an enormous airplane. And before I go any further, just because I think I know the answers, I have some family friends here from South Dakota. Um, has anyone ever seen a B-1 either in the air or at an air show by raise of hands? So that's, that's what I thought, right? A, a fairly small number of people. And so before I even get into the agenda or what we're going to talk about, just to give everybody else an idea of kind of what a B-1 is like, because you know that is a little bit of a distorted picture. Let me just show you this quick one minute video to give you an idea of what a B-1's really like. So those afterburners are about 30 feet behind the airplane to put them in context, probably 10 plus yards of flame that's coming out of each of those four engines. Not too bad, right? You want to, don't want to be on the flip side of that. So that's, that's to give you an idea before we even get into the size, the capabilities of the B-1. And I brought a lot of pictures, I brought a lot of videos to help bring it to life, like Greg said. Um, the agenda today is pretty simple. You can see it behind me up there. I'm going to give you a quick background. Um, Greg just did a great job describing me, but I'm going to go into that just a little bit more so that you know how I ended up here talking to all of you today. And then we're going to talk about the B-1. We're going to talk about everything from the records that it's set. We're going to talk about why it was developed, what it's done in combat. We're going to talk about low levels. Um, if anybody here remembers what a VHS tape is, and by looking out, I think most people probably do, um, I went back to the VHS tape from 1995 and um, took some low-level videos, which are actually very hard to find if you try to Google them online, but we'll see those. And then at the very end, because I've done talks like this before and I, I get great feedback about the audience participation part, I'm going to put up a slide. It's going to have about 13 different topics on it. And anything you want to know about, ask me. And I can either talk about those topics or anything else that might be in your mind. So without further ado, let's get in real quick on the background. I am the um, uh, third of four military generations on my father's side. And so my grandfather, people love pictures. My grandfather was a Navy CB in World War II, jumped across the Pacific, uh, building runways, building infrastructure for the Navy. My dad was a CH-46 pilot, uh, very similar to the CH-47 that you see in the middle. He was in the Marine Corps. He was awarded 39 Air Medals. That's the top one that has the orange and the purple on him. One of them was for valor, and my father was shot down three times in Vietnam. I, I always hesitate to put this picture up because I never looked that cool when I was in the military, but that's OK. I'll leave that up to my dad. And then you've already seen this picture. That's me in front of a B-1. 
And by the way, that's how you look when you're like 24 years old, and that's what you get to do for a living. I've changed a little bit in the last 31 years, but that's okay. That's me in front of a stealth fighter getting ready to go out on a combat mission in Yugoslavia. Those are the 2,000-pound um, laser-guided bombs that we carried in the stealth fighter. And then like everything, there's a, uh, there's a new generation. Um, so I said four generations, the last three all pilots. This is what my oldest daughter flies. It's called the C-17. It's an amazing airplane. It's a picture of her going into Guam. And that's a picture of her with uh, my other two daughters. And again, a new generation doing great things for our country. In fact, um, my daughter evacuated Kabul, if you remember that, roughly a year and a half ago, um, and helped bring out part of the US Embassy and everything else. So that's a quick introduction to, uh, to my family and the generations that have served our country. Greg touched on already, I went to the Air Force Academy, um, was fortunate enough to jump out of an airplane almost 300 times while I was there. Um, and even though I don't think it was that fun while I was doing it, I just have fond memories today. So um, great stuff. Greg did a great job describing my background. Um, when I went to pilot training, the, B, the last B-1 was delivered to the Air Force, and we'll talk about it in a minute, in 1988. I graduated from pilot training in 1990, and it was my number one choice out of pilot training, and I was very fortunate uh, to be given a B-1. And as you can see up there, I flew B-1s for roughly five years at Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota and accumulated right over 1,000 hours. In my entire career, I flew the T-38, so the little airplane that's up in the upper right-hand corner, um, that small black one. I flew those while I was at Ellsworth. I flew them at a pilot training base following the B-1 where I helped teach new pilots how to fly. And then when I went to the self fighter where I ended up with about 600 hours, as instructor pilots, we flew T-38. So I ended up with roughly 1,300 hours uh, in the T-38 while I was in the Air Force. And then the last thing that I'll, that I'll say uh, on the background is it's, um, it's great to be an Air Force pilot. It's great to have spent 20, the last 20 years in the business world. Um, but the most important thing in the world to me is my family. Um, this is a picture of all three of my daughters and my son. By the way, um, my son is a senior at a small school in Kansas called KU. Any basketball fans in here? Let's go Jayhawks, 3 o'clock, Texas, Big 12 championship. Um, but anyway, no, this is my family, and I'm fortunate enough to have my wife here today. So, Danielle, thank you for all the support over the last 32 years. Fantastic. You clap for military spouses, sure. <laughs> we'll leave the fact out that um, while I was flying the F-117 in combat, um, Danielle had our youngest daughter who's standing next to me right there, and I didn't see her for about three months. But... Those are the sacrifices that uh, military spouses make, so they're amazing people. So, before we get into the development of the B-1, and if anyone knows the answer to this, please don't yell it out to other people. If you ever meet someone that can't poke fun at themselves or make fun of themselves, get away from those people. I like to poke fun at myself. So I go to the B-1. You guys might have seen on the presentation, it says bad to the bone. And, and the B-1, people refer to it as the bone. They say, oh, the bone, he flew the bone. The crazy thing about the Air Force is you get formal names, like the F-16, the Fighting Falcon, but we all seem to call it the Viper. You have a B-52, a Stratoforce, they call it the Buff. It's just a nickname, right? And if you go all the way to the bottom, you see the B-1, and it's the Lancer. And so I get a B-1 on a pilot training. I go to the training base in Dias, Texas, to fly this airplane. And the first day, I'm sitting with an instructor pilot. I'm like, hey, it's the B-1B Lancer. Why do we call it the Bone? And the guy looks at me and he says, well, it's because it's a B-1. And I said, well, I'm aware of the airplane. I asked for one out of pilot training. It is a B-1. Why do they call it the bone? And he walked up with a marker and he wrote, because it's the B-1. And then he wrote, the bone. <laughs> Did anybody else know that? Or am I the only unintelligent person here? <laughs> Pretty cool, right? I'm, I'm not aware of any other airplane where that's ever worked out. I don't think you'd be able to pronounce some of these other things if you put the airplane together. But anyway, that's why they call it the bone, if anyone asks you. So let's talk about some facts, just again, to kind of level set us on what this airplane is, and, and more importantly, the size. So everybody here is probably pretty familiar with the 737. I think it might be the most common airplane that's ever been produced in the US and maybe around the world. But to put the context of a B-1 um, next to a 737, 
A 737 fully loaded with gas, the weight of the airplane, and with passengers and luggage weighs about 190,000 pounds. The B-1, that airplane that we saw in that video at the beginning, weighs almost 480,000 pounds fully loaded. So two and a half times, probably the, the last uh, airliner that most of the people in this audience flew in, no matter where you went in the United States. It was wild because I flew the B-1 from 1991 to 1995, right? And so it was funny, I was just trying to check. We could literally be on the 32nd anniversary of my first flight in the B-1, which I know for a fact was in March of 1991. Um, so 32 years ago, and I used to say the same thing that I heard a pilot say on YouTube when I was researching the B-1 for this presentation, and he said the B-1's built to carry two things. What's the first thing? Fuel, very good. Second thing, bombs. Look at you guys, we'll end the presentation right now. You're way ahead of me. But this is what's crazy about the airplane. So remember I said it was 190,000 pounds is what a 737 weighs. If you look at the amount of gas that a B-1 can carry, it's one and a half times the weight of that entire airplane. Over 44,000 gallons of gas can be carried on a B-1. And then to put the weight of the weapons that a B-1 can carry into perspective, when we switched to a uh, from a nuclear role, because that's what the airplane was invented for, over to a conventional role, we could carry 84 500-pound bombs in the B-1. So there are three bomb bays, each with roughly 28 bombs in it, right? And we could carry 21 tons of bombs in a B-1. So amazing airplane, amazing size, and by the way, the most capable bomber that we have in the Air Force today, when you look at a B-52 or a B-2 and compare it to a B-1, the amount of internal ordnance that a B-1 can carry is just amazing. The airplane was supersonic, so it could go faster than the speed of sound. You know, we like to complicate everything in the military with acronyms, and instead of saying the speed of sound, we say mock. Um, a B-1 could exceed the speed of sound if needed. And then the four of us sat up front. There were two pilots in the Air Force. We call it an aircraft commander and a co-pilot in the airlines, a pilot and a co-pilot. And then in the back, we had two other officers. One was an OSO, remember I said acronyms, offensive systems operator. He did our navigation. He helped us with all of our bombing and our planning. And then we had a DSO, who was the defensive systems operator, that controlled all the chaff and the flares and things that we made to decoy missiles and to protect the jet. And he also had a very, very complex um, computer system in the back that was made to spoof different radars that were trying to see a B-1. So put the B-1 into perspective, four people, a ton of gas, and a ton of bombs. We're going to look at a couple of pictures again to put the airplane into perspective for all of you because, of course, we don't have one here. Does anyone want to guess why I put this picture up? Because it's pretty benign. Anybody want to guess why I picked this one? The crew chief that's standing on the left side where the wing is, when you look at how big that person is compared to the airplane, that's the real perspective. That picture of me that was on the first slide where I'm standing you know, 200 feet in front of the airplane so the airplane looks tiny, that's someone standing next to the wing. Just enormous. This is a picture just to give you an idea of some of the ordnance. They couldn't carry all of this at the same time. But remember when I said that we could carry 84 500-pound bombs? That's the first two rows on each side. By the way, that was hard to count. One, two, three, four. There's 21 in each of those four quadrants on the front. And then the third row represents 24 bombs, which when we talk about smart munitions, and we'll get into that a little bit more later, JDAMs, J, um, JASMs, it can carry 24 of those. And then probably the neatest part about this picture is that front rotary launcher, the B-1 was made so that it could be quick load. And so if you almost think of a revolver of a gun, the B-1 had a snap-in module that would allow it to drop bombs as that circular part clicked around and each of those came off the airplane. So again, just a very, very capable airplane. Great picture of the airplane. There was so much to cover in this presentation and I only wanted to take roughly 40 minutes so we have that time to interact at the end. We're not even gonna talk in depth about the fact that the wings of a B-1 
we're typically in that position, which is at 15 degrees. That's where we used it for takeoff and landing. But when we went fast and when we were down low, we had a manual lever in the airplane that we would pull back and we could sweep the wings all the way back to 67 degrees. So the airplane, the wings were essentially tucked into the fuselage. We can kind of see the opening on the side over the nacelle, but guess what the next picture is? 67 and a half degrees sweep. So that's what the wing positioning was like when we went down low. And I have to really acknowledge um, Santos Caceres. His name is in the lower left-hand corner. He actually lives here in California, and he's a prolific aviation photographer. And we've become friends on Instagram, and he was very, very gracious uh, to send me these beautiful pictures of the B-1 to use for this presentation today. The three bomb bays, a little bit difficult to see maybe, but it's very clear to see the one that is behind the main gear. And then there are two other openings. One of them's behind the, the nose wheel, and then there's one in the back. But three bomb bays on the B-1 that could be configured in, in a multitude of different ways. And those two whiskers that you see on the front of the nose, again, so many topics to talk about. That'll be one of the 13 topics at the end. It's called smucks. Those little veins were made because the B-1 was so long that when we were down low, without those, the flex on the back of the airplane would have literally broke the airplane, or at least broke the spine of the airplane. So that was a computer-controlled system that would dampen out the ride when we were down low. And again, we're going to see a video of that as we get farther into the presentation. Another great picture of the B-1 wings back. And then the last one, this is a B-1 approaching a supersonic speed. You've seen these pictures before where fighters go the speed of sound and they build up that shock wave. This is a B-1 essentially doing the exact same thing. This was a great slide because in our presentation, it might be printed on your bulletins, it says that the B-1 holds 50 different world records. I, because I'm a research type guy, went online and Boeing, who, you know, it's a Boeing B-1 today as they exist, they claim that the B-1 holds 100 different world records. I don't really get into, you know, splitting hairs and semantics and everything else. The caveat is the last portion in that quote that says, in its class. But I can tell you, having spent 1,000 hours in a B-1, that in all of those things, whether it's speed or time to climb or payload, whatever it might be, it's not surprising to me at all that a B-1 would hold some of those records. These are three speed records they're on the Boeing website, and again, you can see that first number. You get in one of these airplanes, and you go New York City to London in less than two hours, right? Not bad. So amazing airplane, amazing capabilities. The development of the B-1, and every airplane today seems to have a lot of back and forth with how they're developed, but the B-1 was really amazing. So you have to go all the way back to the Cold War, and you have to go back to the late 50s and the early 60s. And the top airplane that you see in the upper right-hand corner is a B-52. And that was the workhorse of the Air Force at the time. That's what we knew you know, was the backbone of our bomber fleet. And what they were trying to figure out, well, what was the follow-on bomber was going to look like. And back in the late 50s and early 60s, the idea was to go super high and to go super fast. And so the airplane that's below the B-52, the white one there, the XB-70, they built two of those. They went out and they flew them. They could go Mach 3. They had six engines. They're very, very unusual looking. They were enormous. And they could go Mach 3, so three times the speed of sound, right at the edge of space. They would fly at like 70 or 80,000 feet because people thought that that was the way of the future. Well, in 1960, when Gary Powers gets shot down in a U-2 at a very, very high altitude, the United States says, wow, that's really weird. We didn't think missiles could get all the way up there. We should rethink how we're going to use this next generation bomber. And that's when they started thinking that maybe going high didn't make sense, but going low and fast made sense. And again, we could spend so much time talking about this, so I'll just say it this way, and, and hopefully you can understand this analogy. I have that bullet point that says, look down, shoot down, didn't exist yet. And what that means in simple language terms is that back in the early 60s, for an airplane to see another airplane, it had to be below it. The airplane had to have no clutter behind it, meaning a blue sky was perfect for another aircraft's radar to detect it. The minute that the airplane was below you, 
So a fighter's radar was looking down, you would lose the target airplane in the ground clutter. So that's why I said look down, shoot down didn't exist at the time. So what, what the government decided to do is they said, look, this whole idea of going fast and high doesn't work. Let's go low and fast and let's do train masking. And we'll talk about that um, when we get to the videos of the low levels. But there's all this back and forth, unbeknownst to anyone because it was secret. They were already talking about building the stealth bomber, the B-2, the one that looks like a bat or a boomerang. Um, there was a lot of discussion about, remember I said all these acronyms, um, air launch cruise missiles. Um, air launch cruise missiles were capable of being launched and train masking along the ground and making it to a target. And so because of some budgetary concerns and everything else, President Carter decided to kill the B-1. And he said, we're not going to go with the next generation bomber. We're just going to wait for the stealth bomber to come out. President Reagan gets elected. One of the things that he talked about, I'm sure most of us remember this, was stronger defense, more spending and everything else. And so he makes a deal so that all 50 states have some piece of the B-1. And what's that good for if you're in government? Getting complete consensus from the entire Senate, the entire House, when you say, hey, this little widget's going to be built in Rapid City, South Dakota, and this little widget's going to be built in Palm Springs. And so President Reagan ultimately gets 100 B-1s uh, approved. And we started to deliver the airplanes to the Air Force in 86. We delivered the last of the 100 in 1988. And then we moved forward with the program. Just because this museum is so amazing, and, and I didn't know this until half an hour ago, has everybody been over to the B-17 hangar and seen that beautiful airplane that's over there, most people? Does every, anybody remember how many B-17s we built? It's on the wall right as you're walking out of the hangar. Does anybody remember? 12,700 B-17s in World War II. We built 100 B-1s. That's what happens when you get smart weapons and you're not just blindly dropping things. So here's a couple of quick pictures. Again, I could talk about this picture forever. This is what the B-1 looked like when I went to it. Um, some really uh, different things about the airplane. First of all, you'll notice the two sticks. There's not a yoke like you would see on an airliner in a B-52. There's that one set of throttles that you can see to the left. There's a second set of throttles farther to the left in this picture that you can't see for the aircraft commander, meaning there weren't shared throttles. We're going to talk about this when we talk about low levels, but around the yellow ejection seats that you can see there, you can see these thick green bands. Those are actually ankle bracelets that were associated with our ejection seat because of how fast we were flying. Um, and then the last thing that I'll point out, we'll be able to see it in the next slide a little bit better when we look at the upgraded cockpit, is that huge black box um, right on top of the throttles is actually 108 separate warning and caution lights um, for the B-1B. This is a cockpit upgrade that they did roughly 10 years ago to make the airplane more modern because, again, the airplane's approaching 40 years in service. And the biggest things that they did for us, as far as looking up there, is the fact that they added a second MFD, a multifunctional display. The two, the one looks really long with all the buttons around it, and then the one to the right. And that was just to give them better flight characteristics. They can see on the second MFD some more targeting and navigation type things. But that's an upgrade that we did to the airplane to make sure that it was ready to fight the most current conflicts around the world. I always had so much respect for the two guys that sat in the back, and, and I'm going to say guys at the time, and um, you know, it was, it was males that were in the B-1, and, and thankfully all of that's changed, right? We've opened up all cockpits to women, and, and rightfully so, in the Air Force. Um, but I always felt bad for those two people because they couldn't see out of the airplane. Um, if that's what they were looking at straight in front of them, right? As pilots, we were looking out glass. That's what they saw in front of them. That's the offensive system operator on the left side. And then his counterpart that he could reach over and give a high five to was looking at the exact same thing. But again, very sophisticated computer systems to help with navigation and bombing and also with defending the airplane. And this integrated battle station is the most recent upgrade to the B-1, and I think it might be the last. So that gave you a little bit of a flavor of what the inside of the airplane looks like. 
We're going to talk about what the B1 was built for. Remember I said that we decided that we weren't going to go high and fast, we were going to go low and fast. And I used that, that expression of train masking. And our radar was called a train following radar. And again, a very, very simplistic depiction here. But what we're trying to show is that where that radar site is, anything that's in the gray bands is detectable because it's a line of sight back to the radar. You can see that below the peaks, that's shielded. And so the whole idea with a B-1, and, and especially when it was invented, and we can kind of talk around the outside of it, but I'm not going to, it was the Cold War. It was invented to carry one thing and one thing only, and that was nuclear weapons. And guess what country are we going to fly to? Anyone? Russia is correct. Thank you. So all the B-1s were in the center of the United States, just like all of our ICBMs, our nuclear missiles. And our role was to take off, fly over the North Pole. As soon as we got into an area where we thought that there were going to be threats, radars, missiles, whatever the case might be, then we were going to drop down and we were going to do this low level and we were going to do this train masking. And so we see it like that, and again, where it says vertical scan, that's where a radar could see you. The whole idea for a B-1 was to fly in those green areas. Those are protected areas. They're, they're, they're hidden from the line of sight because the airplane's so low or the airplane's in a valley or whatever the case might be. And so that was the whole concept behind flying a low level. We already said that the enemy couldn't detect us. To give you an idea of how, what a B-1 was capable of, we had a switch, it was just a toggle switch, and we could go back to the cockpit picture and look, but it said like A through J, and A meant we were telling the airplane to fly 100 feet off the ground. And by the way, we haven't talked about the fact that when we were 100 feet off the ground, we were flying nine-tenths the speed of sound, and we'll put that into perspective in a minute. But we could dial how high we wanted to be off the ground. I wrote 200 feet in this one. And then to make it really cool, if we really wanted to stay hidden, it was great to do it at night, it was great to do it in weather, and it was the perfect situation if we were flying in mountains. People always say, so, so how did it do it? How did the airplane know how to train follow? In the nose of the airplane, there was an enormous, very complicated radar system that would sweep out in the front of the airplane to see terrain. And a computer program would build a course so that we could fly and maintain whatever that altitude was that we had set in the jet. The thing that was really crazy is that when we would start to turn, right, the first time I went to the airplane, I was like, well, that's great, we're flying in a straight level flight, but when we go into a hard turn, what happens? Well, the radar would actually turn inside of the nose corn or attenuate what it was looking at, and then it would start super scanning because it didn't want us to come around the corner in the middle of the night or in the mountains and just run into something. So again, the complexity and the fact that people could come up with this kind of a development in the 60s and 70s, just absolutely mind-boggling. The other thing that's really important is that third bullet about it being efficient. So if, if this microphone was the highest point on one of our routes, and if we had set 200 feet, if the airplane would have been not as intelligent as it actually was, we might have ended up in a situation where we're at 200 feet, we get to a peak, and then the airplane balloons way up over the top before it goes down over that peak. This computer system and this radar was so smart that it's scanning nine or 10 miles out in front of us, because by the way, that's not even a minute, um, and it's scanning that distance, and it would, it would do a calculation so that when it saw the highest peak that it was going to encounter, it would start a gradual climb, so as we cross the peak, we would be at whatever altitude we had set, that 100 or 200 feet, and then it would slowly let down off the backside. And maybe other people don't find that amazing. I find it absolutely incredible. The last bullet point, we were completely hands off. The jet was flying itself. It was going point to point. Like I said, the train following radar, it's dark out. It didn't matter if I could see or not, right? The, the jet is following the train. And the only thing that we did as pilots in the front is we protected the stick like our hand was literally sitting on our thigh, and we controlled the throttles. So we were in charge of the airspeed, and if we were on time going into a target, and it was always the conversation that we were having with our offensive systems operator. Train following problems. People used to always say, so you're, you're in the mountains. We used to always practice in Utah and Arizona and Colorado. 
You're in the mountains, it's two o'clock in the morning, you're doing this train falling at 200 feet, there's a problem with the system, what happens? To protect us, to protect the airplane, the way it was built is if we did not intervene in any way but there was a problem, meaning the system was scanning and it was seeing something that it didn't think we could get over, or if it was having some kind of a control malfunction, the jet would automatically go into what's called the fly-up mode, where it would fly away from the ground. If we were in bank, it would roll out and then it would just start to pull up. And if we didn't intervene, if we didn't put our hand on the stick and cut it off, the airplane would have tried to do a loop. It would have just kept going because, again, it was going into fail-safe mode. It didn't want us to get hurt. It didn't want the aircraft to get damaged. And so it'd start to do this fly-up. What we would do, and again, because we love all these acronyms, um, MSA, Min Safe Altitude. We would chart the center line of wherever we were flying point to point to point, and then we'd look out roughly three to five miles and make a corridor, and we'd say, what's the highest peak? We'd add 500 to it, and so on every leg on the map that we are looking at, and now what's displayed on those new MFDs, those multifunctional displays, there's an altitude, and the three people that weren't flying the jet, the other pilot, the offensive systems operator, the defensive systems operator, their whole thing was climb to whatever the altitude was, 4,500 feet, 4,500 feet. And it was a very rehearsed and practiced thing. It's very dangerous, obviously, going that fast at that speed or that fast at that level in the middle of the night. So when I flew the B-1, I used to go to air shows and I used to say, we're faster than a bullet, right? Because who doesn't like a little bit of hyperbole? And I was like, that can't be true. So I'm prepping to come out here and do this, and I'm like, were we really faster than a bullet? And so I got online, and a 45 caliber military loadout bullet, I think they were fired from an M1911, and it's the first thing that'll come up on any of the Google searches you want to do on your phone right now, and I checked it on like 20 different websites, 830 feet per second. That's how fast a 45 caliber slug goes when it gets fired out of a gun. A B-1 at 0.88 Mach, we could go 0.92 Mach. At 8.8 Mach, it's 1,000 feet per minute, or per second. And at 0.92 Mach, it's like 11 or 1,200 feet per second. So I wasn't just talking you know what. I was telling people the truth. We were faster than a bullet. And I was, I was finally able to verify that. And that's incredible to think about it. To put it into context, and we'll see it right now when we watch these videos, to go a statute mile, 5,280 feet, if you're going 1,000 feet per second, how long does it take you to go a mile? Five seconds. Wow. So I was going to save this to the end, but I, I find all these really strange facts that always get stuck in my brain that just blow my mind. So we were flying so fast down low. And we had an ACES-2 ejection seat, just like every airplane that the Air Force had, F-16s, F-15s, whatever. And what they would teach you, because you'd have to practice it once every six months or whatever, in any jet was when you were going to eject, you'd do three things. You'd pull your feet back and get them right up against the bottom of the seat. You'd pull your elbows in so that you could reach down and grab the ejection handles. And then you'd push your head back against the back of the headrest and you eject out of the airplane. The problem when you're going faster than a, a bullet is that there was a warning in the B-1. Did I just, there we go. There was a warning in the B-1 that said, during ejection, be careful of flailing injuries. So I have an identical twin brother, and he has a really good sense of humor. And when I told him that two weeks ago, he said, you mean like getting your leg ripped off? And I said, yes, just like getting your leg ripped off. Flailing injuries meant if you're in a B-1 and you're not in that position and you're going 1,000 feet per second, and if your hand goes like this, then that's the last time you see your hand. Or your leg goes like that, that's the last time you see your leg. So in a B-1, there were those bracelets that we saw around the ejection handles. We would clip those right above our boots on both legs. They had a metal circular grommet in the back with a line that went back underneath the seat. And the only reason that was there is if you ejected out of a B-1, as the seat went up the rails to go out of the top of the airplane, 
those lines would pull your feet back into the perfect position. So whether you wanted your feet there or not, they were there when you went up the rails. On our ejection seat, our harness, the two straps that came down, there was an extra piece of fabric on both sides. And there was a little tiny thing that must have been an inch or two wide on each side of the ejection seats. At the same time that your feet were being pulled back in, this really heavy duty webbing would get pulled out of both sides of the ejection seat. So if your hand was on the stick or on the throttles or whatever, this webbing would pull you in and put you in a cocoon. So your feet had been pulled back, you were wrapped in a cocoon, like a cocoon of netting, and then you would go up the rails. Who develops that kind of stuff? I love these engineers. Thank you, engineers, for doing what you do. And then I was going to leave this for the end, but this is kind of funny. So we had a low-level route that we used to fly in Utah. And the B-1, because it was made to fly over the North Pole, I mean, we had so many radios, it wasn't even funny. I mean, we had UHF, we had VHF, we had some frequency that could go halfway around the world. We had all this stuff. Well, it just so happened that we could hear the equivalent of, I think it was like Channel 19 or whatever frequency back in the day that truck drivers used to talk on. You know, guys that were driving over the road. So we had this, this low level that we would fly in Utah, and I don't even know what the interstate was, but we would come over this mountaintop, and we would be looking down like three or 4,000 feet, and the jet would be at 200 feet off the ground. It'd be 1 o'clock in the morning, and we'd be ripping down, and perpendicular to us, you could see these trucks, these semi-tractor trailers that are driving like this. Well, I always thought, I would love to see this, so I'm going to do it for these guys. And so right before we'd get to the interstate, I'd light all four of those afterburners. And I would throw a blue flame 30 feet out of the back of the airplane at 1 o'clock in the morning. One night, we came racing across the interstate. We're listening to this frequency, and all of a sudden, I hear this guy go, what in the hell was that? <laughs> and I just sat there for a minute, and I looked at the guy I was flying with, and I keyed the mic, because we could talk on that frequency, too. I heard it was really bad for their radios, but I did any anyway, and I said, Sir, that was a B-1 bomber. And he said, how do you know that that was a B-1 bomber? And I said, because you're talking to him right now. And the guy goes, stop talking to me, Don. And just, we had so much fun. Every night we flew in. And after the first time we did that, I said, I only want to fly that low-level route, and I only want to do it at 1 o'clock in the morning. I want to see a B-1 come over with four burners going faster than the speed of sound. You guys ready for some videos? So... Um, it's much more common today if you get on Instagram or any of the social media sites. When I was in the Air Force, it was forbidden to have an air, uh, a camera or anything else in the cockpit. But a little bit of a little breaker. So on my final flight in the B-1 in October of 1995, I was with one of my best friends. We'd gone through the program together. I have some funny stories for, about him at the end. Um, but I took up a handheld 9 millimeter camera because I knew I was never going to get the opportunity to get it. And when I start this first video, I'm going to pause it for just for a second. I'm going to show you guys something. But what I want you to look at, the first video is going to last about a minute, but it gives you a feel. Again, I tried to Google B1 low-level video, and I was pretty surprised. I couldn't find anything on it. I don't want you to concentrate as much on what's going on inside of the aircraft. Anytime that you can see outside, watch how fast everything's going by. I mean, it's insane. So. Here's the first video, and I'm going to stop it right at the beginning of the video, if I can. And the reason I stopped that is that big gauge that you can see right now, that 1.0, does anybody want to guess what that represents? Mach. Very good. People are doing it already. Instead of saying the speed of sound, they say Mach. So we're going 0.9 Mach. The B-1 was really cool because it was the first airplane, instead of having normal round dials, and you'll see them in here, there were these white tapes for all of our engines that went up and down. And on this, all of these spun up and down. But yeah, we're going nine-tenths the speed of sound right now. So when I look at Scott, who's sitting to my right, there'll be a shadow next to him as this fades out. And when you see how fast the shadow's going across the ground, you're like, oh my goodness. The round dial that I keep on trying to see, but it's obviously, it, was, it wasn't like you were getting shaken in a can, but it wasn't the smoothest ride in the world going that fast down low. 
is our radar altimeter to tell us, see the shadow? And the crazy thing about it is some of our low levels would last an hour and a half. I mean, we've, we've seen 30 seconds of this or whatever. We do this for an hour and a half. And I think right now he's hand flying the jet. So he's not using the train following system. He's letting it do it. I think we go to the left side of the airplane, my side right here. And when you see how fast these roads and some of these buildings are going by, and I guess 32 years will do that to you, but I'm like, we did that? Right there, we're probably about five or 600 feet off the ground. That radar altimeter, that dial, is probably 600 feet. You know, we had to be really careful. We would, we would have to avoid livestock. I mean, livestock have been killed on multiple occasions because the thing that we haven't talked about, and I never even thought about it for this presentation, we flew so fast that you didn't know we were there until we were by you. Meaning, if you've ever seen one at an air show in South Dakota or anywhere else, when the wings are swept back and when it's going 0.9 Mach, when the airplane's coming at you, you can't see it. You still can't see it. You still can't see it. And then when it passes you, you can hear it. And we would always do our best to avoid because we would go even around uh, herds of cattle or whatever, and the minute we passed them at 90 degrees off the wing, I could just see them scattering. So it was, it was pretty amazing. These next two videos, again, are just to really show the speed, they're much, they're, they're not nearly as long. Like I look at that and I go, is that sped up? And I'm like, no, we're going a mile every five seconds. That's not sped up. That's just what we're doing. There we are again, right at 0.9 Mach. In one of the videos I had, we were at like 0.93 and I read something that we weren't supposed to exceed 0.92, so I didn't use that video. There's that shadow again. This last video only lasts for about, I think, five or six seconds. It's wild because Scott's rolling out of a turn, and when you see the trees that start flying by him right now, um, again, the sensation, watch as we start to climb out and just watch in the background. I'm gonna quit the job I have right now and go back and start doing that again. Looks like fun. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of a feel for it. Before we get to the last point, where we let you guys ask some questions, we're gonna talk about the evolution, we're gonna talk about the use, we're gonna talk about the future, it's three slides. Um, we could talk about the evolution forever. I already said at the beginning of the presentation, we were built to be a nuclear bomber. I said alert, if anyone knows where that is, what that is, where we had loaded airplanes sitting in what we call the Christmas tree on the end of the runway. I wouldn't go home and see my wife for seven days and I would go through all these crazy security things and then I would eat, sleep, and do everything in an alert facility. But it was a nuclear role. The Gulf War breaks out in 91, and they're like, wow, you know, we could really use a conventional uh, aspect to this, right? Why is it just um, a nuclear role? And so they start to convert it over to a conventional role, and ultimately it was written out of start, meaning they did some things to the airplane that made it so that it wasn't capable of carrying nuclear weapons anymore. So we go to the first conventional capability. I told you when I flew it, we could carry dumb bombs, the same bombs that have been used since the beginning of time, World War II and whatever. There was no guidance. And they were, they were just, we were relying on the systems in the airplane um, and in math to get the target or the bombs onto target. And then what happened was as the jet continued to evolve over the last 20 plus years, we were able to carry JDAMs, Joint Directed Attack Munitions. They were the same bombs, but they had a GPS kit on them. So just like you have great GPS on your phone or in your car, these bombs can be dropped at very high level. And because of GPS and some fins on the back, they have a range of almost 15 miles. And they're fairly precise at what they do. Those JASM weapons, those are um, joint attack surface missiles. So they're essentially a thousand pound cruise missiles. They have a range of almost 231 miles. And so the airplane really evolved with the more sophisticated, um, smarter weapons that we have in the Air Force today. Um, this sniper pod, which is something that's carried externally, we didn't have that at all when I was in the airplane. It makes it so that a B-1 can now target moving targets. Think Jeeps or tanks. I don't know why you take a Jeep with a B-1, but think moving targets. That's how precise the airplane has become. 
And then we saw the cock uh, pit upgrade that happened nine years ago when I showed you the difference between the two. And this integrated battle station where you saw the integration that goes on to make it a very modern airplane happened just three short years ago. So here's use. And these are some really amazing facts to me. So Operation, first of all, the B-1 was first used in a thing called Desert Fox in 1998. I didn't even put it up here. Um, there wasn't a lot of use, but it was the first time that it was used in combat. Well, the next year, in 1999, that's when Operation Allied Force broke out. That's when I flew the self fighter next door in combat. But B-1s were used in that conflict for the first time in a very large scale. And as you can see those stats, six B-1s flew 2% of the sorties, but 20% of the total ordnance. And that's going to be a common theme. This is Afghanistan and during freedom. So in the first six months, eight B-1s delivered 40% of the total tonnage that was dropped. And then in Iraqi freedom, which lasted for eight years, less than 1% of the missions that were flown were flown by a B-1, but they ended up dropping 43% of the total number of those joint directed attack munitions. So pretty incredible. And this is really the last slide. I'm doing okay on time, I guess. This is the future. So anybody that's been in business, you have these strategic meetings. My wife does this all the time. They plan out five years in the future, seven years in the future. In the Air Force, they plan out 20, 30 years in the future. And a couple of years ago, when they published what's called the Bomber Roadmap for the Future, this is what they said. They said, um, we're going to phase out the B-1 and the B-2. So the stealth bombers, the B-2. We're going to phase out the B-1 and the B-2 in the next, we'll call it 10 years, in 2030s. And by the way, that's much earlier than what we thought. We thought both those airplanes were maybe going to go to 2040, 2050. And it's going to be comprised in the future of this plane that's in the picture. In fact, the Air Force just dropped some more very new pictures of this airplane. It was, I think, on Friday. This is the B-21 Raider. It looks very much like a B-2, a stealth bomber. But the B-52 is still going to be in service for the foreseeable future. And I was telling some friends of mine that I'm fortunate enough to be here with today, they, the B-52 came out in the 1950s. You want to talk about a success story, that airplane's going to fly for almost 100 years. Um, but our bomber force is going to go from what it is today, B-52s, B-1s, B-2s, to purely B-52s and this new 21 Raider. So the thing that I didn't put up here or talk about is that, remember I said we built 100 B-1s. We're actually down to 45 of them today. And we can talk about why in a minute, but let's just put it this way. And I read this this week, and I totally agree with it. It was made to be a nuclear bomber. So it was made to sit on the runway and wait for the call. And the way we've used the airplane over the last 40 years is we've flown it down low. Remember that I said the airplane's so long that it flexes and it does all these things. We've done touch and goes where you take uh, not 477,000 pounds, but a very, very heavy airplane and let the gear touch down on the ground as part of our training. And for lack of a better word, we've really beat these things up. And we've used them way outside of the scope that they were really intended to use. And so that original fleet of 100 it's down to 45 airplanes, and there are two bases in the United States. Two bases in the United States. Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota, that's where I flew them. And then the training base, Dias Air Force Base in Abilene, Texas. So, first of all, before, because you can pick any of these things, and I'm more than happy to touch on them if you find anything on there that sounds appealing, but. Before I even do that, are there any general questions? And, and again, that was very high level. At first, when I was coming out here, I was like, how am I going to have enough material to talk for 40 minutes? And then after like three days, I said, well, this is going to have to be a four hour and 40 minute presentation. I mean, it, it's the most incredible bomber. Everybody's going to debate it, right? You're going to say, oh, B-52 has been around 100 years. It's the best bomber ever. The capabilities of this airplane are just incredible, and, and it's really cool. So any questions, or does anybody want to pick a topic? Please, thank you for having me.